a list of distinguished credits. Uh, but when I was putting sh uh, the show together today, I realized that Lauren's neighbor uh, is a mentor of mine, and I want to dedicate the show to him today. And his name is Billy Taylor. Billy Taylor uh, entered into my life when I was 12 years old, uh, an early jazz fan in West Hartford, Connecticut. And on Saturdays, I used to uh, tune into a New York radio station, WNEW, which was kind of hard to pick up sometimes. I had to like move the, the radio around a bit to uh, make sure that I could hear the signal. And uh, Billy was really like the first jazz DJ that I heard. And he kind of brought me into the music in a, in a very powerful way because he was so warm, inviting, and knowledgeable that uh, it made me want to want to check out jazz. And uh, consequently, hold on one second here to make an adjustment to go live on Facebook. Consequently, that was my kind of my opening into jazz. And I became more of a Billy Taylor fan when I moved to New York, got to hear him live, and I was very lucky to work with Billy. In fact, without Billy Taylor, there would be no jazz video law, no jazz video guy, period, because in 2004, I was producing jazz websites. I had been a jazz writer and worked on the internet uh, with uh, the first major jazz website, Jazz Central Station, and some other stuff. And I began producing websites for musicians. And uh, Billy and uh, Joe Lovano and Sonny Rollins were the first uh, sites that I did. And uh, Billy was extremely supportive. And I was at his house one day and I said, you know, I'm gonna to start to uh, put video on the web. And he had a closet in his office, so kind of a Fibber McGee-like closet. And he opened the door and he had all this content and he gave me a box of videos and he said, why don't you post some of these? And that was the basis for my, the beginning of uh, the jazz video guy. So before we start out with Lauren, I'd like to play a Billy Taylor video. William Edward Taylor, universally known as Billy, was born in North Carolina and schooled in Virginia. It is hard to say what he hasn't accomplished. He is a performer, a lecturer, a regular television host, a radio station owner, a soloist with symphony orchestras, a trustee of the Rockefeller Foundation, a member of the National Council of the Arts, and a composer. Jazz is a way of playing. Jazz is also a repertoire of pieces. Jazz is America's classical music. Jazz is many things. Now, the thing I'm proud about is that jazz was created by African Americans. And uh, many of the people who are my predecessors had uh, great ideas about how to combine African ideas with uh, European ideas and ideas that came from other cultures. And so what we have is a uniquely American music, something which uh, speaks to the idea of individuality. Generally speaking, why teach jazz? I mean, why not just feel jazz, and listen to it, and move to it, and everything like that? What is there to learn about jazz? Well, jazz is America's classical music. It is the music that uh, says more about who we are and what we're about than any other indigenous music. Uh, when I travel around the world, one of the things that comes through loud and clear to people who don't have the kind of freedoms that we have is the fact that the performance of jazz is a very democratic process. Uh, last night when I performed with my group, I had uh, 11 musicians, all of whom uh, were in their, each in, in his own way, was a star. And uh, so as I featured them, I mean, one could see this guy does this very probably better than the other guys. This guy does that probably better than anyone else. And yet, in order to make the music happen, we had to play together. And uh, uh, so when it really was most successful was when we did whatever we did together. And this lesson is not lost on uh, 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 people from other places who don't have the freedom, in some cases, of doing their own thing, if you will. It is uh, a means of personal expression, which is unique. The, the energy, the rhythms of jazz, uh, uh, the, the feeling, uh, the melodies, all of these things are a part of our tradition and they express different aspects of who we are, what we're about. When young people learn this, then uh, they get a different sense 
of who they are and what they're about. And uh, we have found uh, in Jazzmobile and in other uh, organizations that I've worked with that the people involved in studying jazz uh, are much too busy to do some of the uh, destructive things that uh, other uh, children their age uh, uh, are involved in. And they really get involved because it's something that says something personal for them. That's a love song. I wrote it for my wife. It's called Theodora. My life in jazz has been uh, uh, one of which I, I'm extraordinarily lucky. I mean, I've been blessed. Yeah, now I want to welcome Billy Taylor's neighbor, Lauren Schoberg. Hey, Lauren. Hey, Brett. How are you? All I'm right. very good to have you in the. In you know, the... I'm 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 looking at my laptop here, talking to you, my old friend, but I'm also facing the wall of my office in my apartment house, and on the other side of that wall, as we speak, is Mrs. Billy Taylor, Teddy Taylor who is now well into her 90s. And seeing that uh, tribute to, to Dr. Taylor uh, just put me in a very special place because um, every time, I mean, it, it, it takes no more than the mention of his name or a certain sound of music when I walk out of my, my apartment and just look in the hallway and I can see Billy uh, I call him Billy. He insisted I call him Billy. Uh, I can see him walking up and down, uh, going to the elevator with his bag, going to yet another gig. And I can see him uh, right on the other side of this wall with Teddy and their beautiful daughter, Kim, uh, who I know. I never got to know their son, Dwayne, who so many people loved. Uh, and uh, I well up with feeling because he was and remains, but he was, you know, America's first musician, great musician, spokesperson for the music uh, with a dedication towards that. I mean, Ellington certainly spoke about the music like no one else and other people did, but Billy Taylor made it his mission to be the spokesman for the music back in, his, in the 1950s, you know, uh, on television, on radio, in mass media, to be that, to be that person. And uh, when I hear him talk and, and I reflect upon, you know, Jazz and Lincoln Center and, and what Wynton Marsalis has done there, what, what we've done at the National Jazz Museum in Harlem and Jazzmobile, of course, which he founded, which Robin Bell Stevens runs now, uh, all these organizations, whether they're small or whether they're large, are in many ways uh, standing on the shoulders of of Dr. Billy Taylor. And your wonderful tribute video there just really brought it brought it right, literally home to me. 
Yeah, I, I feel very blessed to have known Billy and worked with Billy. And, you know, in addition to all of his accomplishments and everything he did for music, Billy was w one of the most warm, uh, giving people I've ever met. You know, I, I spent time with him at a number of jazz conferences at IAJE and Jazz Times and other things. And people would come up to Billy, every single person. He looked them in the eye, he talked to them. He made them feel like they were important. And they, he was a humanitarian. And, you know, that's something that really stands out. Billy had a life in jazz. You have also had a life in jazz. Is it true that you learned to play the saxophone because you were inspired by Lester Young? Yes. <laughs> and how did you, how old were you? And how did you learn how to play the sax? <laughs> well, I started playing piano as a young kid. I started piano at four and studied it quite extensively. But the saxophone was just because uh, my local hometown library had a copy of the Benny Goodman Carnegie Hall concert. Uh, and I heard the saxophone and I loved it. And I kind of taught myself to play it. I had a couple of clarinet lessons, but I couldn't play it. And uh, I kind of taught myself to play the saxophone because I was fell in love with Lester Young's playing. And how old were you at that point, Lauren? Well, I started piano when I was four. I started. I was studying piano with Sanford Gold in New York by the time I was 14 or 15, but it was about 15 when I started playing the saxophone. And did you see yourself having a life in jazz at that point? Well, I was very lucky. You know, there was a place in New York, uh, which you'll remember, Brett, uh, the New York Jazz Museum on West 55th Street between 6th and 7th. And when I was 14, I started working there as a volunteer uh, because there was this great guy there named Jack Bradley. Jack is still very much with us. He lives up in uh, Mass up, up in Cape Cod. And Jack was very tight with Louis Armstrong, who had just passed away. And, and it was a wonderful scene. So through being there when I was 14, 15, um, I got like uh, an elevator up into the the jazz world through Jack Bradley. And so it was all part of a big picture, the love of the music, the love of the, the history, the discographies, the musicians playing the piano or saxophone and, and seeing Dr. Billy Taylor, by the way, uh, probably not that young, but pretty soon after on CBS Sunday morning with Charles Corral and Billy's segments there, which you mentioned him giving you copies. He gave me a, a set of DVDs of all his, um, uh, of all his Sunday morning pieces, and they should be archived and made accessible somewhere. And uh, But anyway, uh, so yeah, it's all just like a big picture. No pun intended. I mean, not a pun, but because we're going to talk about rare jazz photos, but that's, that's part of the story. But you were there. You were on the scene. You've always been on the scene, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. Well, I do know exactly what you're talking about, and uh, those were golden days, in a, in a way, uh, a renaissance in America. In American arts in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. Now, we're going to cover your life kind of through the pictures, but why don't we talk for a second about why you started the group Rare Jazz Photos? Well, you know, Facebook was a lot of fun for me because years back I used to do radio. I did on WKCR and w WKCR, WBGO, and some other places. I did a lot of radio, and I loved doing the radio because you know, I could do like extended, you know, a show on something and play records and people would call. And I really kind of enjoyed just like sharing, sharing the love of, of a topic. And for whatever reason, that went by. I got more into teaching and playing and, 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 and the National Jazz Museum in Harlem, which has taken up the last 20 years of my life or so. But with Facebook, you know, I started a Lester Young Appreciation Society and then a Dave Tuff one and a few other ones, all in addition to what we do, with, you know, as I mentioned, with the National Jazz Museum in Harlem. And I had a bunch of friends, a bunch of friends, less than a dozen friends, uh, maybe just five or six or seven, uh, who, you know, we would send each other rare photos we would find online. Rare photos, that's a whole other thing to define. But they were just photos of jazz people that we loved. And so I started this group with no more than less than 10 people, with no thought that it would ever be anything more than that, uh, just, you know, a small little group and it started to cotton and now we're pushing 30,000 members. Crazy. Wow. Incredible. Well, let's look at some photos and we'll talk about, uh, the, the subjects and you, and we got to start with, uh, Mr. Benny Goodman. Uh, 
Now, you worked with Benny. How did you come to work with him? How did you come to manage Benny Goodman? Well, what happened was his last big band uh, was my big band. And the way that that happened was, uh, uh, well, I, I was a big Benny Goodman fan. And early on in my career, I, uh, when I was still in high school, I got uh, to know Hank Jones and Teddy Wilson, who lived in suburban New Jersey. And I used to follow them around as a fan and just sit and watch them play the piano. So I, you know, I, they'd, I'd go to gigs and, and I'd be around the world of Benny Goodman. And I love that kind of music. And uh, in my last year at Manhattan School of Music in That's how the Benny Goodman thing started. And uh, we've heard a lot of stories about Benny. Uh, what can you tell us about what was like working with him? Uh, Benny was like your uh, eccentric uncle or something. He was uh, he was distracted a lot, you know, like you talk to him and he was kind of like this. But uh, Warren Vache and Ruby Braff and, and other people eventually told me that, you know, uh, what people saw as personality quirks were, for the most part, he was literally thinking about how to play F sharp on the clarinet or if I do this, it's a little sharp or flat. He was so monomaniacal about music and that clarinet that, you know, he was kind of uh, distant at times. But all I can say is I thank my lucky stars. I had the opportunity to be around him. He was no better and no worse than anyone else. He was just a normal human being except when it came to making music. So he had his quirks, but no more than anyone else. Well, just look at this one photo here. This is from 1941. It's uh, Benny. I think that's it's Georgie Ald on tenor, Cootie Williams on trumpet. Who's that guitar player? I have no idea. But, you know, but, you know, but this was, no joking, that's Charlie Christian. But the interesting thing is that actually, Brett, there's a story behind this photo which I never realized until just now, because I've never seen it blown up on my computer this big. You see they're on WNYC. And Ralph Burton, uh, who was an early jazz journalist and jazz writer, left-wing kind of guy, he was the younger brother of Vic Burton, who had played drums uh, with Red Nichols on a lot of famous jazz records back in the 1920s. He was a famous drummer in the early days. He had a radio show on WNYC. And he was friends with these guys, and he got Benny to come play. And he had the acetates uh, of this, of the recording of this. And he bought copies of it to uh, my WKCR FM radio show back in the early 80s. And we played these acetates. And it was new material taken exactly at that moment with that legendary band. And since then, that broadcast, I don't think it's ever even been uh, released commercially, but it exists amongst collectors. And uh, so I never put two and two together, but that's uh, a magic moment in music history. You know, uh, Benny had a couple of other magic moments. One, of course, was the Carnegie Hall concert. Also, uh, his trip to Moscow in 1962. Why do you think that was important? for the State Department, and it was very important because that was right in the middle of the Cold War, and although, you know, uh, there was Gary Powers and U-2 and Cuba, the Cuban Missile Crisis and the Bay of Pigs, right at that moment, right at the moment that JFK and Khrushchev were, you know, hanging up the phone or whatever they were doing at that time, uh, Goodman took a racially integrated band over to uh, Russia to tour with Teddy Wilson and Joe Newman and Bill Crow on bass, who wrote about it famously. Excuse me. And uh, it was a real moment. Uh, you know, there's a wonderful book called Satchmo Blows Up the World, which is a book about the U.S. State Department 
tours, and uh, this was that was one of them. Some great music. Oh my God! Famous record came out, Benny in Moscow. But the truth is, it was recorded all over the Soviet Union. And the uh, the Carnegie Hall concert. Why was that such an important moment in jazz history? Americans have always had, especially them, but, you know, we have some kind of like a cultural inferiority complex that somehow, you know, music that comes from Russia, uh, mu music that comes from Europe, mustard that comes from Europe, wine that comes from Europe, the language that comes from Europe somehow is more, uh, more sophisticated. And so uh, for jazz, you know, African-American creation, uh, you know, to wind up on the stage at Carnegie Hall uh was quite a thing now you know there had been a jazz at carnegie hall before fats waller had played there james p johnson had been there but uh not like this so this was very 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 special now laura after you you uh, did some work with benny you were uh you were on the radio on wkcr uh did some stuff with uh dan at uh, at, the, at the jazz institute in rutgers how did the National Jazz uh, Museum come about? Well, um, I spent about 15 years, you know, very busy in New York. Working, uh, whenever Benny Carter would come to New York, you know, he'd have me put together a band for him. Uh, I was Bobby Short's musical director for many years at the Cafe Carlisle. I was working with Sylvia Sims and recording with my own band and uh, uh, just, you know, having a real rich musical life. And then I started teaching by accident because I'm a college dropout. But I wound up teaching in the graduate school of the school I never graduated from. So I was very lucky. I, I, got, in at the, I got in at the tail end of all that stuff. And so uh, Leonard Garman, a great man, uh, who was a, a good, high-level, self-taught jazz uh, musician guy, uh, had the idea to create a jazz museum. And it had starts and stops. And around two, the year 2000, he asked me if I would consider taking this thing on to try and build this darn thing. And I did. And pretty soon I had Christian McBride at my side and we did it. And what, what's the status of uh, the jazz we seem today? What's the scope of activities? Where is it located? It's probably closed now, but when it does open again, how can people access it? Well, we're doing a lot of public programming. All you have to do is go to our Facebook page or go to our YouTube page. Uh, last night we had an event with Christian McBride and John Batiste and uh, Catherine Russell and all kinds of great folks. The Jazz Museum is up and running. Uh, where the physical location is 58 West 129th Street. Just a hop, skip, and a jump from the Red Rooster and all the famous Harlem places. And uh, it's very much involved and ongoing right now. A priority is finding work and funds to support the musicians right now who are facing this crisis and the audience too. So I would just urge everybody go to the Jazz Museum website, just Google National Jazz Museum in Harlem or go to our Facebook page and uh, you'll see uh, what we're doing. We're doing a lot of stuff right now, actually. Before the broadcast, Lauren and I were talking about the current situation because we're both concerned about our friends and fellow musicians and the venues, uh, some of which are not going to be able to survive this. Lord, what are your thoughts on all the streaming things that are happening with musicians performing online now? Well, I'm really happy that, that the musicians, that we musicians are finding an outlet for creativity and that people are watching it, but there's a much larger question. You know, there was an article, I forget, it was in, maybe in the New Yorker I saw today online or something, but it was about the future of the restaurant industry. And that, you know, will it come back? Can it come back? How will it come back? And maybe it's time for a, a huge reshuffling of the whole concept of what a restaurant is, believe it or not. Uh, and I think in terms of performing and making a living from performing, you know, the rug has been pulled out from all live musicians, you know, for decades now. And YouTube, as much as we all love it, and I'm the first one to say that I use it all the time, um is really kind of a horrible thing in a certain kind of way because uh, there's no money for the people who created the stuff. And so uh, 
I'm glad about the streaming, of course, you know, because it keeps everybody going and alive. That's that's vital so you can get out of bed in the morning. But I'm looking forward to a much larger discussion about what the real import of this crisis is and what's going to happen with people who are so passive. And even the jazz photo, the rare jazz photos group is a symptom of this. Uh, you know, looking at pictures, listening to old records, all that stuff. You know, how many of those, how many of us who do those things think about using any part of our income? And granted, you know, it's a financial crisis across the board now for most people. But even a dollar a day, a darn dollar a day towards an artist or an artist's organization to somehow get money to these people. Uh, that's what kind of preoccupies me. And I'm hoping that at the end of all of this, something will shake out that will redress or will address this real injustice. Not to get too heavy about it, but that's really what I think. Yeah. So right now, great. Stream, play, contribute to people's accounts and do what you can. But if it's possible, let's look at the larger picture about starting to support musicians with your own money. And not being so passive. I mean, very few people vote in this country. We wonder why we're in the situation we're in, uh, regardless of which side of the political fence that you're on. People feel aggrieved wherever they stand. And it's because most, you know, a, a huge percentage of people don't have the the whatever to get out of bed on no, on vote day and go vote. And so I guess what I'm saying to get back to you, Brett, and, and our broadcast here is we also have to vote with our funds when it comes to supporting these musicians. So anyway, if the, if the Rare Jazz Photo Group, largely writ, can be seen to represent something or a gathering place, I hope it might be a gathering place for people with a passion for this art form and then nudge them in some way to, to support the people whose pictures they love to look at. Yeah, absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. I have a love-hate yeah. relationship with YouTube. I love the access to the content. I am very bothered by the fact that so many, most musicians get absolutely nothing for anything that appears on YouTube. Uh, but we're not going to deal with that issue right now. We're going to look at some photos. <laughs> so okay. let, me, let me put some up here and have you talk about them. First, the first photo here is a, a man that, Many people don't know, uh, but you, someone perhaps you could say something about. His name was Pops Foster. Yeah, that's George Pops Foster, who was one of the er jazz bassists. I mean, he was there at the very beginning in New Orleans. Uh, he came up to New York from New Orleans in the 1920s to play with Louis Russell, who, by the way, is Catherine Russell's uh, father, who uh, she performed as part of our National Jazz Museum in Harlem series last night with Christian McBride and John Batiste. And he, uh, you know, he's on some of the iconic uh, early Armstrong records. He, he was with Louis Armstrong's band. And he was kind of like, I don't know what to say. Like, you know, when people think of, of uh, Christian McBride or people think of, uh, of Charles Mingus or people think of, you know, Ray Brown or Oscar Pettiford or, or, you know, or all the great younger players of today. Sorry, Christian. I think you know what I mean by that. Uh, Pops Foster is, the guy who back in 1920 was already doing it in that context. Great, great player. Yeah. Well, that's why we're glad to have you here, Lauren, because you know, you know about these people and, and we certainly want to know about them as well. Here's an interesting photo I found in the group. It's Art Blakey, Tony Williams, and Elvin Jones. Woo! Wow. God, can you imagine... Three generations, three generations of the greatest jazz drummers. You know, Art Blakey, who came up in Fletcher Henderson's band. And then, you know, Elvin Jones, you know, who played with Ellington. <coughs> just for a moment, you know. But, but you know, with John Coltrane and, and Tony Williams, you know, who was a disciple of Roy Haynes's, who, was, who came out of Blakey and everybody else. There's so much history in that photograph. I could just look at it forever. But that looks like, yeah, it says Hotel Nagoya. So they did famously, they did a tour of Japan in the mid 60s. And that clearly was taken uh, at that point. Wow. I think there's some, there might be some video, you know, there might be some film of the drum battles with those guys. I'm not sure if Mel Lewis was on that tour. Uh, um, but anyway, yeah, there's some great, wow, Jesus. Yeah. Great picture. Here's a couple of heavy cats. 
Max Roach and Charles Mingus. Uh, this looks like Newport, perhaps. Oh, yeah. uh, I know one year at Newport they ha they had like an alternative festival. I'm not sure if that this was that. Well, I doubt it was that year. I mean, if they're at Newport, but well, no, but it could be. Excuse me, no, it, it could be right. The Newport Rebels. Uh, there was a you know the great history of the Newport Jazz Festival started in 1954, and then right I believe it was 60, 1960, and the and the, going into 61, uh, there were problems with the city of Newport and the licensing for the festival and and kids getting drunk. A whole bunch of issues came together, and for whatever reason, Mingus and and uh, and Max Roach flew the coop from George Ween and started their own alternative festival. Great photo, maybe it's taken the same day of Ornette Coleman and uh, Kenny Dorham playing with Max Roach and Charles Mingus. But uh, I mean, look, you know, even just looking at these two, I mean, they were, you know, they were not, besides being virtuosos and innovators, they were, they were philosophers. And I mean it in the serious sense of the word. They had a philosophy, and the music was an offshoot of their philosophy towards the science of music and the science of life. I mean, I'm sure you've heard, Brett, in all your years as a journalist and, and being around. I know I heard. Uh, I never saw. Well, I did see Mingus in person, but I never heard him talk in person. But I did hear Max Roach talk to Kenny Washington and many other younger drummers. And he was, uh, even his face in that photo, it's kind of like a, an historic profile of a of a thinker well, that's a great photo jesus yeah i got a chance to to uh to hear mingus live a number of times and i once went to a a rehearsal do you remember there was a club on 58th street for a while called storyville run sure. by rigmore newman place downstairs yes uh yeah. i went to a mingus rehearsal there one year it was for newport and uh while Mingus, Mingus was an explosive personality, you could think that's fair to say. And uh, there was some photographer who was like, he was bugging Mingus. And at one point, Mingus turned to him and he said, why don't we step outside so I can kick your ass like a man? Yeah. Oh, I love stories about musicians like that. No, <laughs> no I, I know what you mean. But he... Uh, yeah, what what a great artist and, and composer he was. And uh, someday, you know, anyone who graduates from any conservatory in America studying any kind of music, you know, will have played music by Charles Mingus. Yeah. Now, this is a, a background photo to the classic Great Day in Harlem. We see here in the front row, Benny Golson, Sonny Rollins, and Thelonious Monk. Uh, in the back, I see uh, Sonny Greer. I think Buck Clayton, Count Basie. Uh, believe it or not, there were only two survivors from this photo, and that's Benny Golson and Sonny Rollins. Yes. Yeah, uh, at the National Jazz Museum in Harlem, we actually had Mr. Golson not that long ago uh, up to the museum uh, to do a talk about that day. And I believe um, Art Kane, the man who took the photo, his son uh, has put out an incredible collector's book of hundreds of photographs taken that day, of which this is one. And uh, we actually sold them at the museum. He gave the museum some to sell to help us raise money. But uh, yeah, no, I mean, that photo, I mean, by the time I was 15, I could name everybody in the photo and, you know, win a bet, you know, for $5 until I met Phil Schapp, you know. And then Phil said, name everybody in the picture. And I said, okay, so I named everybody. He said, you didn't name the kids sitting in front and Phil actually knew who some of those kids were. And by the way, I send my best wishes to Phil Schapp because he's been, he's not been well the last couple of years. It's no secret. He's, he's talked about it on the air and I, I hear he's recovering and I hope he's feeling great right now because we all owe him such a huge debt, but that photograph, Oh my God, that's yeah. beyond belief. You know, when I, when I wrote the caption for that in the museum, I, it, it was something like imagine uh, Sojourner Truth, W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, you know, F Franklin Roosevelt, uh, Lyndon Johnson and uh, Duke Ellington. And I don't know. I just threw out names like that. I mean, the whole, I, think, I think it was a better list than that, actually. But it was like to try to make people understand what it meant to have those people there at one moment. And that was taken the year I was born. And that's always a meant, meant a lot to me because I, you know, even though. 
I got to know some of those folks, got to make music with some of them. But uh, the, at least I was born into a world where those people existed. Yeah. Now, here's one of those special people. This is our friend Jackie McLean and his monkey. He did an album, in fact, called Capucine Swing. And uh, I did not realize until that that Jackie McLean had a monkey as a pet. <laughs> This is, these are the things you learn from rare jazz photos, you know, the, the group on Facebook. And, you know, it's kind of funny, like, I feel like I'm plugging it. You know, there's no financial interest, as anyone knows, who has a Facebook group. In fact, that that darn site takes a lot of my time. Uh, but um, I feel like I'm plugging something that, you know, that somehow I'm involved with. But, uh, yeah, that, that look at that photo. Ooh, creepy looking. Th well, I mean, he's a cute little monkey. Uh, and and he's being held there by Jackie McLean, and uh, you know the wonderful Jackie McLean. There's another man that you know we could talk about for for a day. A guy with a philosophy, and he put it to work because he started that jazz institute uh, where I taught briefly up at the Hart School, up at the University of Hartford in Hartford, Connecticut, right near your hometown. And uh, you know he he stood for something. This guy, and he did something. Uh, the older I get, every day that goes by, the more I'm, you know, the more I I'm humbled and 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 love those people. Yeah, they're they're yeah. special people. People like Jackie. I mean, when he moved to Hartford, he invigorated the scene there. Uh, yeah. At uh, he's taught at the Hart College. Then he started the Artist Collective with his wife Dolly and the bassist Paul Brown, and some other folks in the community. They built a six million dollar facility in one of the worst neighborhoods in Hartford, bringing art to people. And then uh, after Jackie passed, uh, they ended up naming uh, the jazz program at uh, the University of Hartford, the Jackie McLean Institute. The, oh, they that's both how it happened. Say what? I didn't understand the progression of how that happened. Okay, I got it. Yeah. Yeah. And the, it's the both the Institute is still going. Javon Jackson is now running uh, the program. And uh, Jackie's son, Renee, is... Uh, running the jazz part of the Artist Collective. And Jackie was into monkeys. Renee is a connect is a collector of snakes and reptiles. So there's <laughs> something in the McLean family about unusual collections. Now, in putting the show together, I was thinking about all the great jazz photographers, and certainly one of them was Francis Wolfe. Francis, uh, one of the founders of Blue Note Records, documented so many important sessions and so much great music on Blue Note. Uh, this is a, a photograph, an early one of a very young Tony Williams and Kenny Durham. I, I'm not sure which recording this is from. Do you know, Lauren? Not at the top of my head. Yeah. What are your thoughts on Francis Wolf, Fran uh, uh, Lauren? Oh, man, you're Brett. I got to tell you, man, you're starting to sound like like uh, Larry King. You know, like uh, you know, you know. All right, Pomona. Count Basie. I'm kidding with you. No, uh, my thoughts on Francis Wolfe. Well, he, along with Alfred Lyon, uh, founded Blue Note Records. So there you go. I mean, you know, one of the great landmarks. And here we're looking at more people, you know, who, you know, who made great Blue Note Records. There's Walter Davis Jr. on the right, looking at his buddy uh, Lee Morgan. And it's one of the great legacies of of American music, the Blue Note label. Here's a, a rehearsal for a famous Blue Note date. And uh, it looks like Blakey in the background and Clifford Brown, who was just came to uh, look at the, who came to hang out at the record date from what I understand, is looking at Miles, who is showing a chord voicing or a chord change to Horace Silver, to Horace Silver. So, you know, and it looks like it's taken at Rudy Van Gelder's living room, I guess, where they made a lot of those records in those days. So, my God. Yeah, that's just, fascinating. Well, I don't think people realize that those early Blue Note sessions were recorded in Rudy Van Gelder's parents' living room in Hackensack, New Jersey. I mean, it's just mind boggling when you consider the amount of jazz history that was actually done there. Yeah. Yeah, true. And I know that, um, who is it? It's a friend of mine, somebody. Is it Frank Kimbrough? Spike Wilner? Ah, some great pianist I know. It's going through my head right now. Someone's very much involved in 
uh, in turning the second Van Gelder studio, the actual one that he built, where all the Coltrane records were made and all the other records, uh, into a, uh, a real landmark and a real either a museum or landmark or historical re recording studio out there in Englewood Cliffs, New Jersey. And that's wonderful work. I'm sorry that I, it'll come back to me exactly who it is, but some, some wonderful person is doing that right now. Yeah. yeah, it should be a national landmark. Now, here's an interesting one. We have Toots Thielman, Cary Grant, and Quincy Jones. Woo! And Judy, Judy, Judy. <laughs> Was Cary Grant a jazz fan? Do we know that? I, no idea. No idea. I, my guess would be that, I, I mean, you have no idea what it was, you know, but it, it might have been a recording date, you know, for a movie soundtrack, you know, that Quincy was doing, that Cary Grant was in the film, and he got Toots Thielsman to be on the, I'm just looking at the what looked to be like wires on the floor or something like that. I have no idea. I, I've never heard of any connection between Cary Grant and jazz, but uh, but yeah, what a great photo. You know, another thing about these photos is they kind of shine a light on the on the many connections of, you know, people who knew one another and who, for whatever reason, were together. And I think many times, you know, when we study jazz or talk about anything that we love, you know, sometimes we're kind of limited, you know, by by just knowing about one thing. And the photographs uh, really help us expand our our purview. <laughs> There's a word that I use when I write. I don't use it when I speak. It just came out. I'm sorry. But uh, can you spell yeah, it? Yeah. Ed Norton. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Cranton, who wrote Swanee River? <laughs> Ed Norton. <laughs> Obviously, I'm, I'm talking to a man who has seen all of the original episodes of The Honeymooners. Oh, yeah. Remains a huge uh, favorite of mine. Yeah, now here's an interesting photo. John Coltrane here playing a, uh, a type of saxophone or an attachment to the saxophone that came out in the 60s called the Veritone that uh, Sonny Stitt... He and I believe Eddie Harris, but Coltrane never recorded with on the Verifone, if I'm not mistaken. I don't think he did. Uh, this might have been, I don't know, you know, I have no idea where that was taken. It might have been taken at his house out in Long Island. Uh, but no, he never did. He never did record with one. One can only imagine what he would have come up with. And it's relatively late because, you know, you can see it's after Love Supreme and after the album on the left. The, is that Crescent, I think? Yes, that's Crescent so, on the left. Right. Right, so this is in the last year or so of his life, but uh, yeah, there he is. I mean, can, can you imagine? I mean, just once you get into these hypotheticals, they never end. Like, can you imagine, like, if Coltrane had jammed with the Grateful Dead and playing that thing? You know, I mean, who knows what he might have done with it? it absolutely fascinating. Yeah, well, I, I know I've read that the Grateful Dead, uh, their long improvisational jams were. Uh, in part inspired by Coltrane's music. I've heard that, uh, oh, I'm a little out of focus here. Uh, David Crosby of Crosby, Stills & Nash is also a big Coltrane fan during that era. Uh, huh. Let's look at another um, uh, Francis Wolf photo that I like very much of uh, Eric Dolphy and uh, Kenny Durham. Uh, oh. A couple of guys who unfortunately left much, much too soon. Dolphy, Mr. Dolphy, before, before Kenny. Uh, Dolphy had a very, very unique conception. I, I think Coltrane picked up on that, which is why I wanted to play with him. Kenny Durham, when I think of KD, I think of one of the great ballad players, someone who's not as recognized today in the music as he should be. What do you think about uh, KD's ballad playing, Lauren? Oh, I love it. Um, I love every part of it. You know, I, I wonder if this photo was taken, you know, one of the great records of all time is Point of Departure. And I wonder, you know, if this was taken at that session. It's one of the late Dolphy, you know, it's one of the last records he made. But um, again, two visionaries here. But about Kenny Dorham, what was the, fr I mean, I heard this when I first came to New York. He had passed away not that long before. And the phrase that trumpet players would always say was he was the uncrowned king. I remember that phrase because, you know, everyone talked about Miles and Dizzy. Well, Dizzy is the father of that whole thing. But, you know, Clifford Brown and Miles and, and, and Freddie Hubbard and all the people who followed and, and Booker Little. 
And uh, they used to call Kenny Durham the uncrowned king because, I mean, you know, he stood on the bandstand next to Charlie Parker, you know, and and everybody else. Uh, and he's an undersung giant. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And his, do- his, his daughter, thank God, Yvette is on uh, Facebook, and uh, we've met actually in person once a long time ago, but uh, she keeps up, you know, she keeps her father's flame alive on Facebook, which is really great. But no, he's he's one of the Matt, one of the all time giants. Absolutely. Earlier we looked at a photo of Tony Williams and K D and our friend Ted Pankin tells us it's probably from the Una Moss session. Ah. Uh, yeah. Um, hey Ted. I know another hey hey Ted, another Francis Wolf photo is of a very young Joe Henderson without a beard. I don't think I've ever seen Joe Henderson without a beard. I'll bet that's, I've seen this photo before, and that's right, and it was a page one, I'm trying to remember, the Blue Note album cover. I know there are people out there who know all the album covers by heart, and I, I'm not sure which one it is. It might be page one, but this, I bet you that this was taken outside of Lincoln Center, uh, which was brand new then. You know, Lincoln Center went up in the mid-60s. I'm not sure the year 63, 64, or, or whatever, but uh, yeah, there's Joe Henderson. Oh, boy. What a master he was. And a young Joe Henderson. You know what I love? Are they talking to you? You know that video of Joe Henderson and uh, John Schofield? Yes, I did it. That's you. Okay, I have to tell you something. That that video, that discussion, uh, should be like required watching for any, not only any young musician or old musician, but anyone, you know, who wants to get inside the head of like what, I was going to say contemporary, but they'll always be contemporary. But, you know, what someone like Joe Henderson and John Schofield, A, the way they relate to each other. B, the way they relate to, and I hope you don't mind me saying this, like, you know, an intelligent interviewer. Uh, and, 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 and the things that they say. That's one of the most uh, incredible interviews I've ever seen. Anyway, I, when I thought of it, I did not think of you. But then as I thought about it, then I remembered it was you. Anyway, yeah. I don't know what to say about Joe Henderson. Can you hear any background conversations? No. If so, I'll close. I'll close no, the door. I, I, okay. I think we're pretty good. Um, okay. Let's see here. <laughs> Next, I'm going to go back to one of my favorites, West Montgomery. This is an early photo of the West Montgomery Trio. Mm-hmm. I believe it's Mel Ryan on organ, and Paul Parker on drums. Wes. Mm-hmm. Uh, has become something of a guitar legend. What do you think it is about Wes's guitar playing that's so captivating? It's great and original. <laughs> I mean, I could go on and, you know, and break it down technically, you know, his thumb, you know, his octaves and all that. But no, I mean, come on. I mean, you know, what what made Louis Armstrong great? You know, he had a brilliant technique and original sound and somehow transcended, you know, beyond people that quote-unquote jazz world uh out to the world at large like ellington like armstrong all those people like that was their goal their goal was not to create music for for a small group of people their goal was that the same people who were buying the beatles records or the rudy valley records or the sinatra records or the whatever records uh that those people would also love what they did and Wes Montgomery, you know, was clearly one of those. But I just want to get get in here quick about the Rare Jazz Photos group that um, one of the most important things about it, and this is kind of linked to the Savory Collection, which is something that we have at the National Jazz Museum in Harlem, which is a, 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 a collection of about a thousand discs of music recorded off the radio back in the 30s and 40s that for the most part, had never been heard, and for the most part was kind of unknown. And we found it, and we put some of the music out, and we've been able to share it. The point being with the Rare Photos group is that in, you know, some closet, in some basement, in some drawer, right now as we speak, you know, there's the photographic equivalent of the Savory Collection or some other great discovery. And my huge concern is that, you know, that drawer, that that box, whatever, is going to get tossed at some point because grandma or grandpa or whoever it was who it belonged to back in the day or great-grandpa, whomever, uh, is no longer around. And someone just going to say, man, it's a bunch of old photos and it's not family people, so 
boom, throw it away. And that somehow that if, if every member of the rare jazz photos group, all almost 30,000 of, of us, uh, could go out in their family or their neighborhood or somehow just put out word. If you have photos of what look to be musicians in old photographs, uh, somewhere in your house, give them to me. I don't mean me, Lauren. I mean me, the member of the Rare Jazz Photos Group, and just get them and rescue them because they're they're part of our cultural history, and that's really an underlying um, uh, thing about the group. I think much more than uh, equally important is to just you know uh, scrolling through and looking at the pictures and liking them. Yeah. Absolutely. How can people get in touch with you if they want to uh, make a contribution of? articles of uh, photographs they found in the attic oh well they don't have to get in touch with me uh they just joined the rare jazz photos page that's it i mean that's i i, I you know i have nothing to do with you know 99.99 percent of of all the people on that group i don't know them i've never been in touch with them it's just a facebook page so all you have to do is go to rare jazz photos on facebook and request to become a member and you'll become a member and then you just scan the photo or take a picture of the photo you know nowadays this is not exactly high tech and uh you know share it share that's it. simple absolutely well let's share another one here from the group we've got oh. uh stan levy on drums leonard gaskin on bass bird miles and dexter and here it is half a century later and bird is still the word oh yeah, yeah, that's a that's an early band of Charlie Parker's. Uh, he talks about it in an interview where he names his early bands. People think, you know, that he just had, you know, the band with Miles and Duke Jordan. But before he went to California uh, in late for in the in December forty five with Dizzy Gillespie, he was leading his own little groups on on forty uh, on on Fifty Second Street. And Stan Levy, Stan Levy's uh, uh, wife. Uh, he's gone now. Uh, Angela Levy is very much on Facebook. Leonard Gaskin, the bass player, I knew very well. Uh, Miles, there's Miles Davis, a young Miles. Just probably, this is probably taken just at the time, you know, that they made, you know, the uh, Charlie Parker's Reboppers session, his first record date uh, in 1944. You know, with now's the time, 1945, with uh, now's the time and all those things. And there's Dexter with his shades. So what a, I mean, you know, these guys are. I mean. I, if Miles Miles was probably just 20 years old when that photo was taken, and Dexter would have been a couple of years older, and Bird, you know, I, I guess Gaskin was slightly older than they were, but they were all under 25 or 20, you know, right around that age. And uh, what a fascinating photo that is. Yeah, let's go back a little earlier with Bird. This is Bird and Dizzy and Billy Eckstein. That Billy Eckstein band was kind of groundbreaking, wasn't it? Yes. Uh, Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillespie, Billy Eckstein, Sarah Vaughn, and others had all been in Earl Hines' big band in 1943. And Earl, you know, had a personnel shift and Billy, Ta uh, Billy Eckstein became more popular. So he started his own band and with him went Shadow Wilson and Diz and Bird and Sarah Vaughn and some others. And there they are. This is one of the uh, great series of photos taken by a legendary uh, photographer in Pittsburgh named Teeny, Charles Teeny Harris. And his archive was donated uh, to an institution and they've made these available. But yeah, oh, look at that. Wow. Did That's a young Leo Parker on baritone, far left, just looking up at them. Yeah. I mean, they were they in their early 20s here, Bird and Diz? They're kids here. Oh, yeah, it was taken just uh, probably a year before the other photo. So Dizzy was born in 1917. So this is 1944, probably. So, you know, you can do the map there. He's 27. And Bird would be uh, about, uh, you know, 24. Yeah. Unbelievable. Here's a photo of another young man before he became a jazz musician. This is Clifford Brown in his new band uniform at Howard High School, Wilmington, Wilmington, Delaware, 1948. Well, you know, like a lot of musicians, it's, it's comforting to know that not only 
you know, the rest of us who played in high school bands with that liar, what they call the liar, you know, the thing. <laughs> I played baritone horn in the marching band, you know, and you got this thing that sticks up that the music is on and you're walking and reading the music and trying not to fall on your face and all that kind of stuff. And the helmet makes you sweat and there was that collar. But but the fact that Clifford Brown, well, it's not surprising. But, I mean, every photo of Clifford Brown is a treasure. You know, to this day, you know, his level of, of artistic and technical accomplishment inspires trumpet players to this very day, just on Facebook within the last couple of days or a week or so. I saw Mike Rodriguez and Jason Palmer and Dominic Farinacci and some others all playing a famous uh, Clifford Brown solo on Cherokee at 9,000 miles an hour. And it's uh, it's like an etude, you know, it is an etude. Yeah. And to see him in high school, Oh, that's a great picture. He was, uh, you know, he was born 1930, I think. So, yeah. you know, he's 18 there. Yeah. Uh, Billy Taylor's daughter, Kim Taylor Thompson, tells us that that photo we looked at of uh, Quincy and Carrie and Toots was uh, around the time that Quincy did the score for Walk, Don't Run, starring Cary Grant. Got it. Thanks, Kim. All right. Speaking of high school photos... One of our favorite uh, contemporary drummers is Victor Lewis. Here is his oh. high school graduation photo. We learn that uh, Victor played basketball. He was in the concert band, the dance band, the orchestra, the pit orchestra, the road show, the All City Music Festival, and something called Student Control. I have no idea what that is, but uh... you know, you, you know, it's funny. Sometimes you look at pictures of of great musicians or you know people who you've seen play and and idolize, and and you see a a, a young picture and you say, what well, you know, is that really so and so? I don't care if you took the name off. Everything everybody would know that that was Victor Lewis. He was handsome then. He's handsome now. But uh, what can I mean? You know, it's almost redundant to say that you know he's one of the great percussionists in jazz in the last 50 years and, and remains so. I saw a wonderful discussion of Victor Lewis, it wasn't Jack D. Jeanette, Victor Lewis and another uh, drummer, a peer of his uh, from the same generation, not that long ago, someone filmed the two of them talking um, about the drum history and uh, absolutely fascinating. Wow. Uh Speaking of drummers, we've only got a few seconds here, but I want to close out with someone that I knew and loved, and I think you also share my affection and appreciation, and that would be Mel Lewis. Tell us about yes, I Mel share. Lewis. A Mel Lewis is Mel what Lewis. you... No, I, I understand. Mel Lewis is what you call a signature drummer. Uh, which he used to talk about a lot, which is a, the kind of drummer that you can hear on a record. And not only another drummer, but most musicians would be able to tell within a handful of choruses or measures that he, that who it is. Because th the way they strike the cymbal, he was not only a great drummer, but kind of an innovator in playing big band jazz drums and a great mentor to me and to a million other people. We did a series on the history of jazz drums, radio shows uh, that uh many years ago that people still listen to but he was a great friend of mine but forget about me i mean he's one of the great jazz drummers of all time ask joe lovano sometime to talk about mel lewis well uh i will uh, joe lovano is uh, uh going to be a guest on a future show look forward to talking to him and somehow we've burned through an hour here i haven't posted half the photos i chose but uh I want to thank Lauren for uh, taking time out from his busy schedule. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're busy. I'm just joking. Actually, Lauren's, Lauren is writing a book on uh, uh, the unique uh, cuisine of Okinawa. No, I'm just Ah, kidding. okay. <laughs> In any event, uh, thanks, for, thanks to everyone for joining us today on Jazz Video Guy Live. My guest Monday will be uh, Claire Daly. Everybody stay safe and have a 